together around your word and indeed be with Chris as he presents your word to us. Help us in the understanding and the reception of your word. Father, we thank you that as we've just sung, that truth is unchanging. Your truth is eternal because you are eternal. Your son, the Lord Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. And the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, we come to a subject that is both challenging, it is also a great blessing. Lord, you, you gave to John the revelation. You said that those who read it and walk in it, that there is great blessing to our hearts and lives. For in it we see the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you just direct our focus upon on Christ, that he is our Lord, our Savior. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It's whatever themes, whatever questions we deal with in the scriptures, whether it be tonight and other evenings and Sunday mornings, Bible studies, the Father, it always will bring us to the foundation of the gospel, the person of Christ who is the Savior of sinners. So we look unto you to help us to see this again, to be reminded of this, and to rejoice in it. We thank you for Chris, and we pray you'll bless him and use him for your glory here tonight. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the question for the pastor is one in which it is given as comparison what are the comparisons of the millennial kingdom the millennial teachings and there are three basic ones uh, post-millennialism pre-millennialism and all millennialism and tonight i asked chris if he would present the the, the first two and so he's taking part one and it's on the subject of post-millennial and pre-millennialism so Come on up. So good to have you here. All right. Okay, I was going to uh, gradually lead into what the question was, but he told you right away. So that throws off like my half of my first note. So thanks. <laughs> I had a couple good jokes as well. Okay. Uh, so this evening, uh, I get to address in part uh, one of the most exciting and debated and heated topics in the New Testament. And this topic I'm referring to is the millennium, or also commonly referred to as the thousand year reign. Uh, I once read a statistic that this topic is one of the most requested topics by church members, but in turn uh, is one of the most avoided topics by pastors. And me being up here tonight is clearly proving that topic or that statistic because he is not here. So the specific question I'll be trying to help answer is what are the different interpretations of the millennium found in Revelation chapter 20? So turn to that passage. We'll read from Revelation 20, verses 1 to 7. Revelation 20, beginning at verse 1 and ending at verse 7. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it 
and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. So before we go any further, uh, there's a few things I would like to clarify. Uh, the first being, I'm not here to try and persuade you of my own personal views and interpretation of the millennium or any other part uh, of the end times. Uh, as much as I would love for everyone to believe what I believe and interpret things the way I do, uh, that is not my goal. Uh, my desire is to present a very balanced and informative and unbiased uh, presentation of the common different viewpoints uh, and that after hearing this information uh, you will go and study this topic further and come to your own conclusions on what you think a biblical interpretation of this topic is um, and second I'm not an expert on this topic I do not have a degree in it uh, and I do not claim to be a know-it-all um, the information I'm going to present uh, is, going to, is from multiple books and articles and videos from strong believers uh, who hold to these different positions. Uh, and I'm here to explain those positions to the best of my ability and understanding. Uh, so if you think I greatly misrepresent a viewpoint, please tell me and I will make amends at some point. Uh, another, another thing to clarify is uh, we're not discussing heresy. Uh, last time I was up here, we exclusively discuss the different heresies held by different groups. Uh, we're not going to be talking about anything like that. There's no heresy of any kind uh, in our study tonight. Uh, what we are talking about are valid beliefs held by many strong brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, fourth, I'd like to clarify what exactly we will and won't be discussing. Um, this is exclusively a look into the millennium referenced in Revelation 20. Uh, and the main interpretations of it. We're not going to be looking into the rapture, the role of Israel, the Antichrist, uh, or any of the other major major points of eschatology. Um, if it's necessary, these things might be mentioned, uh, but they're not the focus of the study. Uh, so again, we are just focusing on the different interpretations of the millennium. And lastly, I'd like to be clear that the terms the millennium the millennial reign and the thousand year reign all refer to the exact same thing. Uh, they're interchangeable. So if I say one or the other, I'm referring to the same thing. So with all that clarified, we can begin. Uh, so again, the question is asked, how do different Christians interpret and understand the meaning of this millennium? And in brief, there's three major views, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism and amillennialism. And so tonight we will look at post-millennialism and pre-millennialism. And the first one is post-millennialism. So what does this name post-millennialism mean? Simply, it means after the 1,000 years, post meaning after, millennium meaning 1,000. So obviously that does not explain much of the view on its own. So I'll read a short summary of post-millennialism. And this, was, this is summarized by Lorraine Botner, uh, a prominent post-millennialist. And he says, uh, post-millennialism is the view of the last things, which holds that the kingdom of God is now being extended into the world through the preaching of the gospel to such an extent that the world is to eventually be Christianized 
and that the return of Christ is to occur at the close of this long Christianized period of righteousness and peace, commonly called the millennium. So the name post-millennial makes much more sense with that in mind. Christ will return after the world is predominantly Christianized. Uh, so first, we'll explain how post-millennialism understands and interprets this millennium in Revelation 20. So post-millennialists understand the book of Revelation to be a book of symbols. Uh, the book is describing present and future realities, but in symbolic language, not literal language. And, and the way of reading the whole book and Revelation 20 Applies that way. So post-millennialists understand the millennium or the 1,000 year reign to be a period in which Christ reigns in heaven, ruling over all things and being head of the church. And through the spreading of the gospel and by the work of Christ changing people's hearts, the world will gradually grow to a predominantly Christianized state. So post-millennialism teaches that the 1,000-year reign began with Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven, and it will end at, the, at Christ's return after this Christianized state on earth. Um, again, post-millennialism understands the 1,000 years to be a symbolic figurative number. It is not a literal 1,000 years. Um, they argue the 1,000 years is a figurative expression indicating a indefinitely long period of time. They understand it to be a number that refers to a complete and perfect number of years in which Christ has determined to reign and rule during this present age. So in other words, the thousand year reign is happening right now and it will end at Christ's second coming. So most of you have probably thought the major distinctive of post-millennialism is the concept of a predominantly Christianized world. Uh, none of the other viewpoints hold to a concept like this, or at least hold to a concept like that, um, where that happens before Christ returns. Um, so let's explain that concept and, and how they believe that to be a biblical uh, understanding. Uh, so if we read Revelation, Revelation 1, oh, sorry, chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, one more time, where it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it, and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So the first thing to remember is that post-millennialists believe that these verses are referring to this present era. This is something that has happened now. It is not something that we are waiting to happen in the future. Uh, so when it says that Satan is bound, so he cannot deceive the nations anymore, according to post-millennialism, Satan is bound right now, and therefore unable to deceive any nation from com or any complete nation from believing the gospel post-millennialism argues that this is the first step for in allowing the gradual christianizing of the world contrasting what it was like in the old testament where satan was allowed to deceive the nations and only one nation which was israel believed in god well now that satan is bound the other nations can now repent and believe. Now, post-millennialists do not rely exclusively on this verse for this belief. There are quite a few verses that post-millennialists appeal to, to try and biblically show that the world will grow more and more Christian until Christ returns. And one of those passages is Isaiah chapter 2, if you turn there. Isaiah chapter 2, and we will read from verses 2 to verse 4. Isaiah 2, beginning at verse 2. 
He says, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So according to post-millennialism, this passage is teaching that in the last days, the church will grow to be the highest of the mountains and it will be lifted up above all the hills and that the church will be the most prominent in all the world's affairs. Another text is Matthew 13. If you turn there. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 33. Matthew 13, verse 33 says, he, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Again, Lorraine Botner explains this parable this way. He says, the parable of the leaven teaches the universal extension and triumph of the gospel. In this passage, we are told that the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven, like leaven, transforms that which it comes into contact with. All the meal was transformed by its contact with the leaven. So similarly, Christ teaches that society is to be transformed by the kingdom of heaven and the result will be a Christianized world. One more passage is Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 30. Mark 4, beginning at verse 30 and ending at verse 32. And Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make its nest in its shade. So post-millennialists understand the mustard seed to represent the church, which starts out small. But by the end of the age, it is the largest of all the belief systems and is where the birds, which represent people from all nations, come and rest in the gospel. So these are just a few of the passages post-millennialists would turn to, to support their viewpoint that the millennium is an era of a progressively Christianizing world. Now, a few clarifications should be made. Um, Post-millennialism does not teach that during this future Christianized era on earth, that it is a sinless era. Uh, yes, post-millennialists do believe that a time is coming when the people of the world in general will be Christian, but they do not believe people will be sinless. Uh, they do not believe that while the kingdom of God is in this world, even in its millennial fullness, that it will be a perfect or sinless state. The only time where man will be perfect and sinless is in the new heavens and new earth. So post-millennialism still teaches that sinless perfection will only happen in the heavenly life. It will not happen on earth. Uh, 
Postmillennialism still teaches that as long as a person remains in this world, even if he is a true believer, uh, remnants of the old sinful nature are still part of man and man will still fall victim to some extent to that fallen nature. So again, even though the world may enter a Christianized era, it is not a sinless era. Uh, secondly, postmillennialism does not teach that every person on earth will be a Christian. Uh, postmillennialists still believe there will be unsaved people on the earth, but the number of unsaved people is much fewer in comparison to the amount of people who are saved. Um, and lastly, Postmillennialism does not teach that this Christianized era will happen instantly. Uh, they teach that it will approach by very, very small degrees over a long period of time. Postmillennialism does teach that there are times of good and times of bad, and it fluctuates up and down. Uh, they do not believe we have only been ascending upwards in, in good. Uh, I like the way Lorraine Botner puts it. He says, the coming of the Christianized millennium on earth is like the coming of summer, although much more slow and on a much grander scale. In the struggle between the seasons, there are many advances and apparent setbacks. Time again, the first signs of spring appear only to be overcome by the winter winds. It often seems that the struggle has been lost and that the cold of winter will never be broken but gradually the moderate spring breeze does take over. And after a time, we find ourselves in the glorious summer season. So again, this Christianized era only comes after a long period of time of true believers going out and sharing the gospel and, and by the work of the Lord, uh, changing people's hearts. Um, so before we finish that incredibly brief overview of post-millennialism, uh, it should be noted that the form of post-millennialism we're discussing is the most common form. Uh, there are obviously many post-millennialists who disagree with each other, uh, and not every post-millennialist will think the same way and interpret every scripture the same way. And of course, there are extremes of post-millennialism, like reconstruction post-millennialism, which is not even really worth discussing. It's such a fringe view. Um, so again, what we have looked at tonight is really just standard historic uh, post-millennialism. So to close that brief overview of post-millennialism and their understanding of what the millennium is and when it will happen, uh, we'll just recap what we have discussed. Post-millennialism teaches that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book describing present and future realities in symbolic language. The millennium in Revelation chapter 20 describes a future Christianized but not sinless era on earth. Satan is presently bound. Christ's millennial reign is happening now. He is reigning from heaven. He will not come to reign on earth. The gospel message will go forth and be victorious over the majority of nations and over a period of time will usher in a Christianized world. And it is after this Christianized era that the Lord in his prescribed timing will return and create the new heavens and new earth where man can finally be completely free from sin and be with his Savior. So the second viewpoint we'll be looking at now is premillennialism. The term premillennialism has become a very broad umbrella term, which encompasses many different viewpoints. Uh, for example, there's dispensational premillennialism and there is historic premillennialism. Uh, these two forms of premillennialism do have some similarities, but overall they do have vast differences and in essence, almost a, a different system of biblical interpretation. Um, however, when it comes to the millennium in specific, uh, there's not that much disagreement. Um, overall, these, those two forms of premillennialism have generally the same viewpoint 
and understanding on what the millennium is, how it means. Uh, but for the purposes of this study, I'm going to be referring to historic premillennialism, um, as historic premillennialism is the older view, um, whereas dispensationalism more so rose to prominence in the 1800s, we're referring to the viewpoints that have encompassed the entire uh, church age. So let's summarize the doctrine of historic premillennialism. Uh, historic premillennialism is the view of the last things which holds that before the coming of Christ, the world will grow worse and persecution will rise. And it will be at the climax of this intense persecution in which Christ will return. And it will be after his return that Christ will establish a period of worldwide peace and righteousness called the millennium, during which Christ will reign as king in person on this earth. And it is after this earthly millennial reign that the world will then be destroyed and the new heavens and new earth will be inaugurated. And this is why they, they would take the term pre-millennial. They believe that Christ will return before the millennium is established. So as we look into how historic premillennialists interpret and understand the millennium in Revelation 20, uh, we should first understand how they approach the entire book of Revelation. As I stated earlier, there's much diversity of beliefs amongst those who use the term premillennial. Uh, so it is hard to give one definition as to how uh, they interpret the book of Revelation. But what appears to be the prominent approach is that premillennialists acknowledge that Revelation contains both literal and symbolic passages, but that when Revelation does use symbolic language, it's very obviously symbolic. And the symbolism is usually explained in that same passage. So therefore, premillennialists believe that it is better to interpret the book of Revelation on the more literal side rather than to risk unwarranted symbolism. And again, not all premillennialists agree with that approach. Some take a more firm stance on the literal side. Others take a more firm stance on the symbolic side. Um, but what I've summarized is what I believe to be the more common approach amongst historic premillennials. Um, so regarding Revelation 20, like post-millennials, premillennials do agree that the millennium is a time of Christianized peace and harmony on this world where Satan is bound, but there are still some differences. First, premillennialists do not believe the binding of Satan has taken place yet. Because of this, they do not believe that the world can be getting better before the Lord returns. Rather, they would argue the world will have increased in evil and in persecution towards the church. And to argue that point, uh, they would appeal to Luke 17, and I'd have you turn there. Luke 17, beginning at verse 26, and we'll end at verse 27. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And we read in Genesis 6 what it was like in the days of Noah. It says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil continually so that the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Another passage would be the parable of the weeds in Matthew 13 and I'll have you turn there. Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. Matthew 24, verses, sorry, Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. It says, 
Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And later in this chapter, during the explanation of this parable, Christ tells us that the harvest represents the end of this age, or Christ's second coming, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one, or the unbelieving, and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, or true believers. So what premillennialists are arguing here is that Jesus is saying the sons of the evil one and the sons of God grow together until the end of this age. To them, there's no indication that Christians will greatly outnumber the amount of unbelievers to the point where we Christianize the world. So for, from the premillennial perspective, these verses we've looked at do, really do not allow for any form of a Christianized era to happen before uh, the Lord returns, which would then move us to the second disagreement with postmillennialism, and this is, unlike post-millennials, pre-millennials do not believe the millennium is happening now. Yes, Christ is reigning in heaven, but that is not the same as the millennial reign. As stated before, because Satan is not bound and sin will increase and persecution will increase, according to premillennialism, this does not fit any description of what life will be like during the millennial reign. So therefore, the logical conclusion is that Christ needs to return before the millennium is established, and that after Christ's second coming, he will then establish his millennial or 1,000-year reign on earth, which will lead to our la the last difference between the two that we'll look at tonight, and that is the location of the millennium. Where post-millennialists see the millennium as spiritual and Christ is reigning from his throne in heaven, premillennialists believe Christ will reign physically and literally on the earth for a thousand years. And again, this conclusion uh, is come to by pre by, sorry, this conclusion is come to by premillennialists taking a more literal approach in understanding certain prophecies in scripture. So for example, Isaiah chapter two, which we read as a support for post-millennialists, pre-millennialists also appeal to that chapter. Uh, and they, they appeal to verse four, which says, Christ shall judge, or he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And by using that literal approach, the premillennialist conclusion is that this verse is describing the time when Jesus will be judging and ruling on earth, and there will be peace, and nations will not know war. And the only possible time when Christ can come to rule on the earth in this way is after his second coming. So to close this section on historic premillennialism, let's recap what those beliefs are. First of all, the book of Revelation is to be interpreted more literally than symbolically. Satan is not presently bound. He will be bound at Christ's second coming. Christ will return before the millennium, and Christ will reign on earth literally and physically 
for a literal 1,000 years, establishing an era of Christian peace. And so it's with that summary we come to our final thoughts on this. So what should we think of these other views? Uh, how should we perceive believers who hold to post-millennialism and pre-millennialism or all-millennialism? Um, well, I think the first thing is I'd love to encourage everybody to study these viewpoints more in depth on their own. Um, there are so many other aspects and things I wanted to discuss and mention, um, but either time would not allow for it or it would drift too far from the original question. Um, so I would greatly encourage you to, to look into these things on your own as well. Um, but from what we have looked at here tonight, I think we should all conclude that Revelation 20 and many other passages relating to the end times are complex. They are confusing. Uh, they are not easy to understand. Uh, and because of that, I believe that you'd be very patient and gracious when discussing this topic with fellow believers uh, who don't necessarily see eye to eye on how to interpret things like the millennium. Um, I think our priority uh, should be when coming to topics like this is to pray and seek wisdom and to discuss with people how they understand these things. And if we disagree, well, let's disagree in a gracious way. And if we agree, well, praise the Lord. Uh, we should not let these things become a test of fellowship. Uh, we should not let these things become divisive. Uh, we should not let these things become the forefront of our attention and distract us from the truly uh, important things. We as believers should seek to show the love of Christ to each other, especially when we disagree, uh, and at the same time, show a, de uh, show a desire to study uh, the truth honestly. Um, and secondly, uh, because these things are confusing, I don't think we should be ultra dogmatic in our interpretation on these things. And I'm not saying that you should not be convinced of your own interpretation. I think it's very important to have a conviction on this and to have a position. Um, but I think it's important to remember there are so many Bible-believing Christians who are wiser and more faithful, more studied than myself, who have different interpretations on these things. So, for example, R.C. Sproul and Lorraine Botner and John Owen all held to the post-millennial position. Whereas Charles Spurgeon and John Piper, Al Mohler, and many early church fathers like Justin Martyr held to a historic premillennial position. So there, I, I don't see a reason for me to be so emphatic uh, in my own opinion that I'm not willing to hear these other positions out. I think our goal as believers is to seek out truth and refusing to listen to and study graciously with a fellow believer on a confusing topic is not going to help us understand what is true any better. So finally, uh, let us remember these major viewpoints, including amillennialism, which was not discussed. All of these major viewpoints all agree on what is essential. Christ is victorious over Satan. Christ is king. The gospel will go forth and Satan will not prevail over it. The Lord will save those he has intended to save. The Lord will sustain his elect through persecution, whether it's now or in the future. The Lord will return again bodily and visibly for all to see. There will be a bodily resurrection. The millennium is a true reality. The Lord will bless his people now and in the future. The Lord will create a new heavens and new earth where sin, death, and destruction are removed permanently. And I believe it's on these things that we should put our focus and intention on, not the secondary issues surrounding the end times. I think the final thing to remember is that for the true believer, whether post-millennial or pre-millennial or amillennial, our desire is to give Christ the full amount of glory, and none of these viewpoints attempt to diminish that at all. We all desire uh, to worship and glorify God as best we can. Thanks.
Chris. Handled that very well. 